Hey everybody, um, here's the new lecture on uh, some material that we've kind of mentioned before, uh, the ADME principles of pharmacokinetics, uh, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Um, and you know the main, the main thing we're going to do is get into metabolism and uh, go through all the different metabolic pathways today. Um, we also have a little small tangent on um, uh, positron emission tomography, which is a medical imaging technique. It's, you know, it's a little bit related to some of the ADME principles because we uh, we'll talk about the use of radioactive compounds uh, to study metabolism and and uh, uh, PET scanning also uses some radioactive isotopes and it's a very important medical imaging technique. Um, so a lot of today's lecture is out of this book, The Organic Chemistry of Drug Design and Drug Action, which we, we've used from time to time throughout the course. Um, th this is a pretty good general book and you know, re related to organic chemistry and pharmacology, which is sort of what we're trying to do in this course. And um, anyway, uh, I've using my book abbreviations, uh, I'm calling this SH8, which is Silverman and Holiday, uh, Chapter 8. So uh, this chapter in this book that talks a lot about metabolism, which is kind of a goal of, of today's lecture. Another book that um, is pretty good, especially if you eventually become a medicinal chemist, is this thing called Drug-Like Properties, Concept Structure, Design and Methods from ADME to tox Toxicity Optimization. So it talks about various classes of molecules and kind of like, almost like functional groups and different um, um, arrangement of structural features that might cause problems like toxicity, like in a drug. So it talks about metabolism, solubility, aqueous solubility, pharmacokinetics, uh, cell permeability, um, um, the CYP inhibition, which are the met metabolic enzymes, toxicity, and also the, the concept of prodrugs, which uh, we will get to prodrugs, and that's actually another chapter in the, in the Silverman book. That will be, I think, uh, coming up next couple of weeks, uh, and as well as to toxicity and prodrugs, yeah. Okay, so, um, and this is, yeah, how to improve drug features, metabolic stability, solubility things like that. All right, so this is kind of the agenda. We have a, we have a lot of stuff to cover. And this might be spread over um, maybe two or more lectures. Uh, so we're gonna get into uh, ADME again, which we've, we've discussed and introduced a few times, absorption, distribution, metabolism, um, which is the main topic for today, and also excretion. So we're gonna spend the most time on metabolism because we, there's a lot, a lot of little things in metabolism. Okay, then we're, we'll get into uh, uh, analytical methods, which you need when you're thinking about ADME and pharmacokinetics. We're usually dealing with very small amounts of material, and so we need sensitive analytical methods to analyze, um, you know, samples of, of substances. And, and we'll talk about the different kinds of analytical methods today. Um, I'm going to have a little tangent into medical imaging and PET scanning, which is a pretty cool thing, and it, it has to do with you know, radioactive substances, which we'll also talk about in this analytical methods section. Uh, then we're going to get into the, the meat of this lecture, which is metabolism, phase one and phase two metabolism, and the different metabolic systems, cytochrome P450, the flavins, and soluble enzymes. These are like three different methods that we types of machinery, I guess, that we use in our met drug metabolism. We'll talk about phase one transformations, uh, oxidation and oxidative dealkylation, reduction, and also hydrolytic mecha mechanisms or metabolism. And phase two transformations will be a little bit later. That's, you know, I think we've talked roughly about these ideas. Phase one is the um, kind of like like uh, introducing a functional group in a drug molecule via oxidation or reduction or um, 
hydrolysis. Phase two is kind of like attaching uh, another molecule to the phase one product, and then that, that enhances excretion ability by your um, body. Okay, so this is kind of a broad overview of what, what you know how, how admin works. Drugs are absorbed into your body, metabolized, mostly cytochrome P450, uh, distributed via plasma proteins in your blood, and then and then through you know at some point they're excreted, uh, usually through your kidney and sometimes your colon. Um, this is another representation of ADME, and that shows a little more detail, I guess. So maybe a drug or a pill might be taken orally, ingested into your GI tract, um, into your intestines. It could be absorbed pretty much right into your liver or effluxed. So this is, a, this is an equilibrium process. Once it's in your liver, uh, it can get processed phase one and phase two metabolism, uh, transferred to the kidney, which could be excreted or circulated through your, your uh, blood supply, uh, distributed to bones or muscles or other you know, parts of your body, maybe into your brain, blood brain barrier, uh, into your lungs, and that, that's also an inhalation route for drugs into your heart, and kind of like just circulated through your body and then and then it kind of works its way back out and, and um, can be eventually excreted through your kidney. So this, you know, this is a simplification of a very complicated system, but it shows some of the elements of, of these ADME systems in pharmacokinetics. Okay, so absorption, as we know, passage of a substance from the site of administration into circulation. Distribution is after absorption, is the delivery of the drug to the site of the action of the drug. Metabolism, biotransformation of drugs resulting in modification that helps their elimination. Alternatively, metabolism may activate a drug to convert it from an inactive state to a pharmacologically active state. That's what we call a prodrug. We've seen a couple of prodrugs throughout this course. Excretion. Termination of a drug activity before or after metabolism. So this can be um, this can occur through urination or exhalation. Um, sometimes it happens through excretion through the placenta or breast milk, and that could have problems for uh, patients that are pregnant. Um, and so after a drug is administered orally. It passes through the liver, which is where a lot of met metabolism happens. Um, and so this short, sort of shows the passage of the, the drug through the, through the gut um, and intestines, through a wall where it can be metabolized into your portal vein, transferred into your liver, and that's where metabolism can happen. So metabolism can happen in a, a few different stages. Um, and um, but I think the majority of uh, first passed metabolism, which are the, the kind of standard metabolic reactions, all, all happen in the liver and, and using the cytochrome P450 system. Uh, other routes of administration that might avoid the first pass effect, and we talked about some of these before intravenous intramuscular, subcutaneous, which is under your skin, sublingual, which is under your tongue, transdermal, which is across your skin, um, and uh, inhalation, a lot of it, um, a lot of like an anesthetics work by inhalation. Okay, so analytical methods for ADME, analytical methods for ADME. How do we, how can we detect substances in the body, high sensitivity? So this is, um, this kind of comes to your analytical chemistry knowledge. You know, what are the, what are the text that, techniques that we use to determine and quantify substances? Um, I, I don't know if you've all had analytical chemistry or 
uh, quantitative analysis, uh, which would talk about these things. But, but you probably have an idea of some of the sort of standard methods we might use. And when we say when we say in the body, this is probably well, we could you know recover a blood sample or also like a urine sample or other. Um, bodily fluids that might contain the drug or the metabolite, but I would say very commonly it's going to be blood or urine. Um, but what are the analytical techniques? Uh, HPLC or LCMS are, are certainly one method, not necessarily the best method, uh, but they are pretty readily available, and um, but the sensitivity may be poor. We'll talk about those in a second. You can imagine a radioactively labeled molecule, and then we could use sort of HPLC, but like a, a version of HPLC that works well for radioactive labeled molecules. The nice thing about radioactivity in radioactively labeled molecules is that uh, the detection is much more sensitive. So, you know, if you, and, and, and com coming back to what, you know, the problem that might arise with HPLC is, is if you're separating out a small metabolic sample from everything that's in urine or blood, it might be hard to see the, the um, quantify how much of your molecule of interest there is. Radioactively labeled molecules would, would really separate and, and be analyzed distinctly from those other molecules. Um, around here we're also going to get into positron emission tomography, PET scanning, which is which also uses radioactively labeled molecules, so it's kind of the how these things are connected. So we'll, we'll talk about that also. Okay, so a pretty easy method for analyzing substances, and this you know is something we use all the time in the chemistry laboratory, is HPLC. And we typically, you know, most people use UV vis detection, which was great because there's no radioactivity. It just has to do with the properties of the of the, uh, the molecules we're analyzing. Um, this is paracetamol, which of course is uh, acetaminophen, or Tylenol, um, and this shows kind of like a typical output of HPLC, and um, so this is x-axis is the, the time course, and the peak, you know, this, this corresponds to the peak of interest, this might be a small impurity, and the y-axis is milliatomic absorption units, and this, this is UV absorbance. So at this point in the chromatogram, the molecule is coming out through, through the column, through the detector, and, and uh, corresponds to the molecule of interest, uh, Tylenol. Um, this is what we mean by UV vis detection. So th this is sort of the basis of how, how this analysis works. So we're absorbing, you know, different molecules absorb UV vis, especially aromatic compounds. I, I probably should have the structure of Tylenol over here, but I don't have that with me. Um, but anyway, at, you know, this is the, the wavelength uh, spectrum, and around, uh, I guess, 243 is the lambda max, which is the maximal absorbance of this molecule. And what we do is we, we tune the detector to, to this wavelength, or, or more generally around 250, 254, which is kind of like a standard uh, lambda max. But the, you know, this, the, the absorbance of ultraviolet radiation is what gives us this type of analysis, right? This is what a typical HPLC looks like. And um, uh, without going through all the details of HPLC, but there, there's solvents up top, which are usually HPLC, or sorry, uh, acetonitrile and water, acetonitrile and water. They're kind of pumped through the system with a pump, one of these, uh, each of these things is a component of the HPLC. So there's a pump which pumps the liquid through the machine. And there's an auto sampler where you put your samples and you can put a whole bunch of samples and they'll analyze them each in, individually. There's a couple other things, and usually the detectors on the bottom. The detector does the, the um, detection, which is like what the UV vis absorbance. So it has a UV uh, light bulb and it detects the absorbance of your sample. Your sample, uh, when we shine UV light through it, we detect the absorbance. That's what, that's what this is showing. Okay. 
Okay, so what are the disadvantages? It has poor signal to noise, lots of background materials in blood and urine or other biological fluids, and that over overwhelmed the analysis. So this is beautiful, and the reason it's beautiful is because this is a pure sample, and this is you know, just shows how HPLC would work. But when you start analyzing blood and urine, and, and you know at at uh, around 254 or so nanometers. Um, you're gonna see a whole bunch of stuff. You're gonna see a thousand peaks, and and it's really hard to, to figure out which one is the drug that you're interested in. Like like in this case, Tylenol. Uh, usually, using HPLC alone, you can't really do what we're doing here, detecting low levels of a substance. Um, it just doesn't really. You can't really get a quantitative measurement very well. Um, Sometimes we would couple an HPLC with a mass spectrometer, uh, which is another another box that would be out kind of on the right over here. And the mass spec tells you or lets you analyze the molecular weight of each peak. So you'd get the molecular weight of this peak and it would correspond to Tylenol. Um, and using that you can kind of filter out all the, the junk from what you're trying to analyze. Sometimes that works, sometimes it, it doesn't work. Um, the goal is really to quantify how much of this you have in your sample. Okay, so we can also imagine using a radioactively labeled molecule. So the example we're going to use is C14, which is a radioisotope of carbon. So it's a, it, it is unstable. Uh, uh, it has a long half-life, so it, do, it doesn't like degrade very rapidly. Um, but it is radioactive. Uh, the cool thing about using a radioactively labeled molecule is it allows more sensitive detection. And we use a, something called a scintillation counter, which pretty much counts the radioactive decay events of the, of the molecule. And we can also use that with HPLC. So you can use the same kind of HPLC. The difference is you'd use a radioactive detector, a radioactive flow detector. And this can be set up, you know, to, to analyze C14 decay. It's much more sensitive, and, and what you're really, you're only analyzing radioactive substances. So if you would give an uh, animal or a, maybe a human a radioactively labeled substance, that molecule is, you're going to be able to analyze it in the presence of non-radioactive substances and be able to see it specifically. Uh, it, there are some toxicity and hazards related to radioactive molecules. Um, sometimes also, you also have to, you know, anal you have to synthesize, you have to synthesize a radioactive substance and sometimes that's challenging. It's not necessarily as easy as synthesizing a, a non-radioactive substance. Okay, so let's talk about uh, C C fourteen, the radioisotope C fourteen, and um, first of all, its its half life is uh, fifty seven thirty years, so it's it, it lasts a long time. Uh, unlike other radioisotopes that degrade kind of rapidly. Um, in order for it to lose half of its reactivity or its radioactivity, it takes like 5,000 years. But it's still, even at, with this kind of slow uh, uh, degrading process, we can still use it and, and, and follow the um, radioactive decay and actually measure it sensitively, which is pretty, pretty amazing, even though it's, it, you know, it's not as radioactive as other things like uh, CF18 in a bit. Fluorine 18, which uh, decays in like the half life, like like a, you know a couple hours almost. It's pretty pretty incredible, and still usable as a as a radioisotope. Um, it's a beta emitter, so it emits beta particles, and we can detect these sensitively using a, a scintillation counter, as maybe as part of HPLC or some other analytical technique. Um, this is a kind of simplification of how the degradation occurs and how C14 gets actually converted to N14. And 
So th- th- there's there's a couple things that things going on. You have like, you know, how how could you go from uh, uh, carbon to nitrogen? I mean, you th- you have to add a proton, but in this process, like a neutron is being converted into a, a proton, and the the actual uh, mechanism of radioactive decay is kind of a, a um, it's it's a, you can sort of theoretical physics and it's a little, little complicated. But the big thing is that a beta particle is emitted, and that's something we can detect using a scintillation counter. Um, how does C14 compare to C12? C12 is sort of the dominant isotope of carbon. It has uh, six uh, protons and six uh, neutrons. And this is the sort of carbon that we usually generally observe. There's also C13, which is a, has an extra neutron. It's not radioactive. It doesn't decay. Um, but it's also used in analytical chemistry because we can we can sort of analyze the amount of C13 present using mass spectrometry. So um, C13 is really important also, and we'll, we'll mention C13 again in a bit. And how do we, if we're going to use a radioactive substance in our uh, like a drug, how do we incorporate it into a molecule? So we can, how do we do that? So it can be, it's possible if we have a source of C14, um, and if, if the molecule is synthesized using natural enzymes, then you just let the, let the natural enzymes do their work. So an example is making penicillin derivatives. Penicillin derivatives, so, you know, you're familiar with this sort of structure. And if you basically can pr- provide radioactively labeled building blocks, and a lot of these can be obtained, um, then you just let the, norm- the enzyme do its work. And the enzyme, which would normally take these building blocks, and assemble penicillin derivatives will also do it if the, if the building blocks are radioactive. It doesn't now. It, d- it doesn't care about the enzymes still work. So the, the enzyme, enzymes don't really care about them, like the number of neutrons that are present. Um, if we have a completely synthetic molecule, we need to use radio-labeled uh, building blocks, so pieces of the molecule that have, have uh, a radioactive isotope embedded into them. And so an example is this molecule, Zyvox, which is an antibiotic. And so this, this just shows kind of like the synthetic scheme of how we sort of start with these pieces. Um, and this is actually, this first reaction is an easy reaction. It's that SNAR reaction that we've mentioned a couple of times. It was, it's an organic tube book also. The nitrogen sort of attacks the carbon kicks electrons all the way through to nitro, then the nitro swings back and kicks off the fluorine. So that, that just attaches the nitrogen to the carbon. A rare case where fluorine is a good leaving group. Um, the SNAR reaction, so nucleophilic uh, aromatic substitution. Um, and then you get this. We uh, reduce the nitro group with H2 and palladium from NO2 to NH2. And then in this, in the example of this molecule, here's where we could attach the radioactively labeled uh, building block. Uh, this is a, a um, uh, chloroformate, benzyl chloroformate derivative. So it's just, it's, a, it's an electrophile. Nitrogen attacks the carbon. Electrons go up, down, kick off the chlorine. So it essentially attaches nitrogen to the carbon. And now we have this carbamate, and this is actually a, uh, a protecting group too. We, we um, may have seen this before, but it's called CBZ. CBZ is this uh, protecting group. And, and um, anyway, so in, in this synthesis, that this, they push forward a bit, they get to this point, and, and now you can see where the uh, radioactively labeled carbon is. That's a C14 right there. And then they might use like radioactively labeled acetic anhydride, and the nitrogen kicks and attacks, kicks uh, off one of the sides. And now we now we've attached a radioactively labeled um, 
acetate group to our nitrogen, so it's an acid, uh, sediment. So now we have two carbons that are radioactively labeled. And, and this just shows kind of the example of like how you might convert maybe a, a um, commercial synthesis or a, a normal linear synthesis of a, of a molecule to, to something that incorporates radioactively labeled sites. This all depends on you having uh, access to the building blocks. And some, some building blocks are available, radioactively labeled. And, and sometimes the shipping of them is kind of complicated. Sometimes you can, you can actually make it, like at a, at a uh, local uh, radiochemistry facility. So like UCSF as the Department of Radiology. And they actually regularly prepare certain building blocks with different radio labels on them. One use of C14 is, is a test called the urea C14 test. And it's a, a test uh, H. pylori, which is a bacteria that infects people in the stomach. It's just a stomach infection. And you're essentially using urea, right? What's urea? It's uh, NH2. C double bond O, NH2, right? And we're using the C14 labeled version of that. And, this, and then we're gonna essentially uh, uh, detect radioactively labeled CO2, carbon dioxide. Here's a kind of uh, scheme that sort of shows that. So here's C14 urea. C14 urea, which uh, you would take orally. And what happens what happens is, is, is this is actually a, a pretty stable molecule, right? And if we're trying to detect the presence of this bacterial infection, the thing is that the, the bacteria has an enzyme called a ureaase, ureaase, and the ureaase will hydrolyze the urea into essentially carbonic acid, right? HO, acetyl window, OH carbonic acid, and then that will be absorbed into your body as the radioactively labeled carbonic acid or, or bicarbonate, and that kind of pretty much way, works its way through your body into your lungs, and then you breathe out C, uh, CO2, C14, CO2, right? Labeled carbon dioxide. And what do we do then? We breathe it into a balloon, transfer it into a, a vial and, and you know a couple steps of this and essentially then they measure the the radioactivity with the simulation counter so they measure the beta particles in the sample and if they see it if they see uh, this uh, c14 labeled co2 then they know you have the infection so it's a pretty clever method to, to detect if you have this stomach infection Uh, more recently, people are doing the same thing with urea C13, which the nice thing is it's not radioactive. C14 is not tremendously toxic because the de decay is kind of slow, but still, you know, if you can avoid ingesting radioactive substances, that is preferable. And especially since urea C13 is completely non-toxic, um, and it generates a non-radioactive C13 CO2. So same thing, but it's CO2 labeled with C13. Um, and remember, C13 is not radioactive, so it's not detected by a scintillation counter, but rather using mass spectrometry techniques that can actually detect things like C13. OK. So let's get into this tangent of medical imaging and PET scanning now. And this has to do also with radioactively labeled uh, substances. Uh, but these are substances that emit something, not a beta particle, uh, but something called a positron. And the two of the, there's a lot of elements that do this, but two of them that are commonly used are F18, so it's a fluorine isotope, a, a non-natural non uh, fluorine isotope, and also C11. So that's, that's got um, it's a different isotope of, of carbon, okay?
and they emit positrons and through you know pretty complicated um, decay processes they you know a lot of, some rearrangement of the neutrons and protons happens through this okay so let's talk about F18 first it's a positron emitter and it's using medical imaging F18 so its half-life first of all is 109 minutes so what is that that's under two hours how could we possibly use this as a therapeutically useful substance like to scan to for the PET scanning agent that sounds crazy like if we put this into a molecule how long will the radioactivity reactivity last well if the half-life is 109 minutes I mean that doesn't mean it's all gone in 109 minutes it means it, it decays in half but pretty rapidly it loses its its um, radioactivity okay so we you can make it using a cyclotron instrument and that these are you know various universities or medical schools have them and they're able to generate these radioactive substances and UCSF has one uh, probably a couple actually at the China Basin campus which is kind of by the the, the, the ballpark um, yeah China Basin area and basically you, you the, that's crazy you you make it and while basically like while a patient is ready for treatment you do some organic synthesis and then you immediately inject the patient with the sample it's a very rapid form of chemistry it's pretty pretty amazing that this works to me actually so F18 is a positron emitter and it's detected by a PET scanner as an example and it's used in medical imaging so F18 um, degrades to O18 and it generates an, an E plus. What's an E plus? It's a positron. So it's the opposite of an electron. It's, it's a, one of these kind of weird um, subatomic particles and, and it can be measured and also it generates a little bit of light. Other things are happening that change the atomic structure from F18 to O18. But the big thing is, is positrons are, are emitted. And you know the the whole process of this and how they make this is a uh, definitely a very specialized art uh, using uh, these special equipment uh, cyclotron, and that essentially bombards a proton with O18 and that makes uh, F19, and then that's reacted with a neutron and that. Um, generates F18. There's, there's some other stuff going on and I, I don't totally uh, um, follow all, all of this kind of radio chemistry. But there's ways to create F18 and we're doing it all the time. So the only question is how do you introduce this into a molecule then? This shows what a, a PET scanner looks like. It's one of these scanning instruments that can scan the entire body and look for things like cancer. Okay, so let's talk about the use of this radioisotope F18, um, it's a positron emitter imaging for prostate cancer, prostate cancer, and we're going to specifically you like um, target, we're going to specifically target a protein called PSMA, PSMA, which is, a, is overexpressed in prostate cancer. So this actually this this project I'm talking about is is actually something that originated at SF State, um, and I was actually a co-author on it on this paper in 2007. So, along with a couple other people, uh, Yoko Toriyabi, who's actually a lecturer here at SF State, Lisa Wu, I think who is is or was a lecturer, but um, I used to work with Cliff Berkman, who was a professor at SF State, and he he left around the time that I. I joined as a faculty member, uh, but I was a I was a postdoc in Cliff Berkman's lab. He's at Washington State Pullman now. But anyway, we, we did some work and we uh, published this paper in two thousand seven, Bioorganic Medicinal Chemistry, which show which had um, so showed some inhibitors of PSMA. And PSMA is it's overexpressed in cancer cells in prostate cancer cells. It is an enzyme. 
It's an enzyme, and, and uh, it's actually a, a protease, or like a, a peptidase, so it cleaves peptides. You would think, you would think that being a enzyme that's involved in prostate cancer, that maybe if we inhibit the enzyme, you could um, maybe treat prostate cancer, right? You'd think that if you inhibit the enzyme, that is, is overexpressed in prostate cancer that it might inhibit the or like stop prostate cancer growth and that's not true this inhibitors uh, don't seem to do that so you can't really stop prostate cancer by inhibiting this okay however what's what's going to be interesting is that we're, we're not going to try to inhibit it we're trying to label it and try trying to like identify large amounts of PSMA. That's that's kind of the goal. And that is, so we're not using this to treat prostate cancer. We're using this to image prostate cancer. That makes sense? So we're trying to identify large concentrations of PSMA. All right. So anyway, what did I do and what did we do in this project? We we identified a molecule. Um, I forgot the name of this, but this is essentially glutamic acid, right? Glutamic acid is this thing. Uh, amino acid, right? Not too exciting, but it has a phosphate on it. And this this functional group is called a phosphoramidate. You don't have to know that, but it, it's essentially a phosphate on a nitrogen. It's a weird functional group. And guess what? It's IC50 against PSMA. It was like 0.8 nanomolar. So it's a very, very potent. I mean, this is sub nanomolar. This is under one nanomolar. So it's extremely potent, extremely potent inhibitor of PSMA. But we're not going to use it for its inhibitory sake. We're going to use it more as its as an imaging lead. And this is a this is actually some of the work I did back then. Uh, this was a computational modeling of this molecule, the phosphoramidate, which is kind of this left piece. And you can sort of see the structure and how really the phosphate is interacting with a pair of zinc atoms. So it's a zinc peptidase. And the zinc is involved in the uh, peptidase activity and the cleavage of peptides, okay? Um, nothing else too exciting here. Okay, so um, I, I was not involved in this project beyond this part, this thing. But later, uh, the Berkman lab, when he moved to um, Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, they did a, a lot of continuing work on the, this sort of uh, structure, and they discovered this molecule. And, um, yeah, this molecule. This is called CTT, CTT, one zero five seven, and it also has a very good IC fifty against PSMA, 0.4 nanomolar. So it's very potent, very very you know sub nanomolar. Um, published in the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, twenty sixteen. Uh, this is in collaboration with Henry Van Brocklin, who's a professor at UCSF in the radiology department that I was talking about at China Basin. So he, he's a, this guy's a pretty amazing uh, radio chemist. So he, he, he works with radioactively labeled molecules. And um, anyway, so you can see something kind of funny over here. Oh, look at that, that's an F-18. So they, they incorporated F18, which is the positron emitting fluorine, right? And what's the half-life again? <laughs> it's like under two hours. So they, they make this, they make this molecule pretty much while the patient is waiting to be injected with it. So it's a very rapid turnaround, right? And this is attached as the last synthetic step about maybe an hour before injecting into a human subject. So they they do the mole they they make it and then they have to rapidly purify it and then the patient's waiting for the injection. So this is pretty amazing fast paced chemistry. Okay, and let's see what else. Um, okay, so these are the three papers, kind of like my, the paper that I was involved in, and then here's a kind of a more recent you know Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, great journal. Uh, but this is this is not a clinical clinical study. This is actually they do, do a little mouse work that will show injecting into mice to uh, visualize prostate cancer. Uh, but but more recently in 2019, Ber Cliff Berkman and some other uh, people, I think also 
Van Brocklin, um, I published this paper, and this is a phase one clinical trial for human prostate cancer imaging. So this is basically now used, or well, it's being evaluated in humans, in humans to visualize prostate cancer, which is pretty cool that this is actually happening, right? Okay, so let's talk about the synthesis real quick. It's not that crazy, the synthesis of this F18 labeled inhibitor, CTT1057. This shows the key steps. I'll just step through them. They have this thing, it's, it looks like a, well, it's a phosphoramidate, which is the, the phosphorus nitrogen thing. What are the BN things? BN is a protecting group. And it's a protecting group that you can remove with H2 palladium. So H2 palladium takes off the BNs. There's also there's another one there and another one there. So H2 palladium takes off BN groups. It uh, looks like there's five of them. One, two, three, four, five. H2 palladium takes off BN groups. Bach, though, Bach is protecting the nitrogen, and Bach is not removed by H2 palladium. As you know from recently, I think one of your homework assignments, Bach is removed by something else. Bach. And Bach is actually removed by acid. And, and acid, TFA is a strong acid. Trifluoroacetic acid. It's just acetic acid with three fluorines on it. Okay? So the first step is, is TFA. What's that going to do? Not going to touch the BNs but it's gonna deprotect the Bach, okay? Deprotect the Bach. And, and then they're gonna react with HBTU, which you learned about also recently, maybe homework, and a linker piece, triethylamine. So essentially, TFA gives you a free amine, so it's NH2. And then, and then the linker piece is actually uh, this part over here, which is the, uh, it's a car it'll be a carboxylic acid with this long chain, right? It's just carboxylic acid. So that would be a carboxylic acid, carboxylic acid, and this chain. And we're ending with a CBZ group at the end, okay? So that's what we do first. We deprotect the Bach group, and we attach using HPTU. It's an coup amide coupling agent, amide coupling agent. We attach a carboxylic acid to make this amide, to make the amide, all right? That's what the first part is, okay? Now, what are they gonna do? Now they're taking H2 palladium, which, what did we say that does? It removes the BNs, it also removes the CBZ. So they, they both are these, these benzyl type groups, and essentially, yeah, we're removing all the benzyls and all the CBZs, so benzyls go away, and the CBZ goes away, leaves you with an amine, so now, the last step is attachment of the, the radioactive piece, which is this F18 labeled uh, benzoyl succinamide thing. This is made in the synchrotron. Half-life is 109 minutes, so it's used fast. You make it, you use it. Succinamide is a leaving group, right? So what happens is again, again, is they take off the CBZ and now they have NH2, right? Deprotect the CBZ, now they have NH2. NH2 attacks this thing and kicks off the leaving group. And now you have your molecule and you inject this into the patient. So it's very rapid, very rapid process to make this radioactively labeled uh, F18 positron emitting substance. Okay? This is all in the J MedChem paper, so the not the not the clinical trial. This is kind of like a proof of principle paper. Proof of principle. Okay, so now um, let's show uh, a little bit of the imaging results for prostate cancer. Oh yeah, actually, no, before I do that, x-ray co-crystal structure of PSMA in this inhibitor. So they, they, they determined an x-ray crystal structure. So they crystallized PSMA, the protein, and they co-crystallized it so it has the inhibitor bound in there and you can see you know some of this kind of makes sense that the phosphate the, the PO2 you know the, the phosphoramidate 
phosphorus, two oxygens. It's talking to the zincs, those two zincs. And then we have various uh, kind of hydrogen bonding interactions with all these arginines and this lysine, and there's a little pocket here. What's the crazy red thing? The re red thing is kind of an aromatic region where the aromatic ring with the fluorine sits. So the, f the fluorine and the aromatic ring are sitting in this pocket right here. Okay, and the PDB is right there, 4JYW. You can download it if you like. This just shows the chemical structure of CTT 1057. Okay, and, and the orientation is kind of reversed relative to this crystal structure. Uh, the, yeah, the red means it's an aromatic binding pocket. And what are the amino acids, um, W and R? Uh, w is uh, tryptophan. And, and I, I don't have the actual structure here, but you can imagine what kind of interaction might W and a benzene have, thinking about our recent interactions we've discussed. A pi system and another pi system. Maybe it's a, a pi stacking interaction. I'm not sure if the angles support that. The other thing also is arginine 511. That's a cation, right? Arginine is a cation, and you have a pi system. So you might imagine a pi cation interaction here. So this, this is actually kind of tightly bound into the active site, okay? Okay, all part of the JMAC paper. Okay, so this is also before the clinical study. This is a preclinical study into a mouse. So this isn't the same J Medchem paper, the middle paper that I was talking about. Okay, so what this is going to show, I'm, I'm showing kind of three parts. There's, a, there's uh, I'm calling left as the other compound. So this is another compound they're studying. Middle will be the this new compound, CTT. 1057, right, will be another compound. So we're, we're going to do a see some mice with, um, we're going to see some mice, and I'll step through it all. Okay, so here's the mice. Okay, so we have kind of left, middle, and right, and each of these mice was injected with cancer cells, with prostate cancer cells. So there's two types of cells they're using. One is CWR22. RV1. This is a, a cancer cell line that overexpresses PSMA. So that it overexpresses the protein that the drug targets, right? PC3 is another prostate cancer cell line, but it is minus PSMA. So it does not have PSMA expression. Okay, so all of these three situations are showing kind of the, the same sort of uh, thing. The middle, and, and what's happening is this, so, the, so when they, they inject the mice with the cancer cells, they inject the mice with the cancer cells, and, and what we're doing is detecting the ability of these compounds to image, to image the tumor cells. And what, we're, what we see in each, because there's there's three different compounds. There's uh, I'm, not, I'm I'm skipping what A and C are. Let's just focus on B. B shows it really nicely. This is our our cool compound. Let's focus on B. Okay. So what B is showing is that it can identify where the tumor is. So this is where the injection the tumor was injected, and these positive PSMA cells were injected. And what this compound is doing is it's not like treating the cancer, it's just imaging it. So it's binding tightly to those, to that, that, those PSMA positive cells, right? And of course, on the right here is negative PSMA cells. And those cells are injected, and this compound is not visualizing them. So it's very uh, nice that our, our compound here our compound is um, selectively and specifically imaging PSMA positive prostate cancer cells in a mouse. So they're injected into the mouse and we can specifically see these CWR22RV1 cells. 
and that's pretty cool. I would say that's pretty cool. This is uh, and the, the the mice are imaged in a PET scanner, like not not probably not the human size one, but like a, like a mouse size PET scanner. Okay. All right. So yeah, these other compounds they're in the paper. You can read it about them. They they look kind of similar, but they're they're not also not as good. You can see that they don't image that they don't image the tumor as as uh, well as compound B. A is not as good as B. It's it's kind of a, you know there's less less uh, signal right, and C is also kind of not as good too. B was the best. Okay. All right. This is all the JMED chem paper. Okay, so now let's now we'll talk a little bit about the phase one clinical study in humans with this ATNF labeled inhibitor. So this is actually a real human study now. Okay, so that's the compound that we're the the, the lead compound that's in clinical trials. What this is showing now, so this is real human with prostate cancer, and it's not not just prostate cancer, it's metastatic prostate cancer. So prostate cancer with metastasis, so the prostate cancer spreads. This is from figure four of the paper. I think there's the paper down there. Okay, so the dark spots show uptake of this compound into cells with high PSMA levels. They identify the high likelihood of metastatic tumors. Okay, so what are, th these are different patients. Patient A has prostate cancer metastasis to lymph nodes. So all of these little spots are, are lymph nodes in the body and all of the little spots show high PSMA uptake. All of these are like basically tumor sites now. This is a pretty bad spot to be, you know, as a patient. You have, you have, you have cancer spread throughout your body, yeah? And this compound is able to identify each of these places and this allows a, a, a doctor to treat these, you know, to, to use radiation therapy or surgery or something like that. Patient B is prostate cancer metastasis, but, but not to lymph nodes. There's definitely spots in various places, and these are other, the, the cancer spread to different places. And you, you probably say that patient B is probably doing a little better than patient A, but, but they're, they're both, um, they have a, you know, pretty severe uh, metastatic cancer. And this is a, this is a you know, very useful imaging tool, because you can do these PET studies with with um, uh, with it, so you inject this into the body, and you know you wait a while, and then you're able to do the PET scan. So, th but the compound's got to be made like right before you use it, right? Because the fluorine eighteen is not uh, lasting very long. It doesn't have to be completely F eighteen. It can be you know degraded a bit and still be active. But nevertheless, this is a this is you know something that they make it and they inject it into a human very quickly and then they're able to get these really nice clinically useful uh, PET scans. Okay, one more example of this um, interesting uh, positron emission tomography imaging uh, method. And this is using not F18, but actually C11, which is another kind of weird radioisotope of carbon. And C11 is also a positron emitter. And they're able to make these kind of things also at a, at a radio uh, chemistry facility like UCSF. Um, so this this is and this is also this is going to be used for bacterial infection. So this is used for bacterial infection. And so we recall, you know, recall how we talked about uh, sulfonamid antibiotics, and how they basically, and how bacteria, how bacteria take PABA, which is um, uh, para amino benzoic acid, PABA, and how bacteria take PABA, and they, there's this folate metabolism process where it gets incorporated into these sort of folate. Uh, precursors and and then eventually get converted to tetrahydrofolic acid right so bacteria take PABA they they utilize PABA and they create folic acid tetrahydrofolic acid 
and that the sulfonamide antibiotics sort of inhibit the first pl first part of this pathway. And uh, yeah, the glutamic acid gets incorporated. There's glue, that glutamic acid right there. Whoops. And glutamic acid, and then and then this uh, trimethoprim kind of uh, uh, inhibits the last step of the synthesis of tetrahydrofolic acid. We did this, we talked about this in detail before, so you can look at the previous notes, of even PowerPoints where we talked about this. Folate biosynthesis pathway and possible incorporation sites for C11 PABA. Chemical structure of C11 PABA is shown. So the, this, the idea will be, like if they, if they can make C11 PABA, they can make C11 PABA and then kind of let it go through the, bio, the bacterial metabolism pathway, that maybe they can, we can detect the position of, uh, we can detect the position and location of bacteria in, in a human, <coughs> human sample, or in a human uh, organism or animal or something. So that's kind of the idea, right? Okay, so how do we make C11 PABA? How do we make that? And, and how do we make carboxylic acids? Think about your organic chemistry. Are there, is there a way to maybe make that bond? Attach the benzene, attach the benzene, like maybe attach the benzene with the nitrogen or something to a carbon that has C11 on it. Or even just think about normal carbon. Like how do you make a carboxylic acid? Can we attach, like maybe have a carbon attack something and create a carboxylic acid. And this is basic organic chemistry. It's, you can, and this is organic two stuff. And this is the synthesis they, they did. So they're, they're, um, they take this molecule, they're protecting the nitrogen, so the amine as a ditrimethylsilyl, TMS, silicon, right? It's trimethylsilyl. So these are two silicon protecting groups on nitrogen. It just blocks the nitrogen. And they have a Grignard. And all they, what they do is they, they react the Grignard with C11 labeled CO2. So the, the Grignard attacks, kicks you know, electrons, and that, that, that makes a carboxylate. And then they do a little bit of HCl, and that, that, that uh, deprotects the silicons, and it also probably gives you a carboxylic acid. But this is how they make it. This is how they make it radiosynthesis of C11 PABA using C11 CO2. So they have to make this probably in a cyclotron or something. And a commercially available Grignard precursor followed by quenching with HCl. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll describe their protocol where they use this and then I'll show the result. So that what they're gonna do is they're gonna inject a, a mouse with uh, either healthy or heat killed uh, E. coli. So this this is wrong. It should be just healthy or heat killed. Ignore the word live. Okay. So we got good E. coli and we got kind of dead E. coli. All right. So good E. coli and dead E. coli into the deltoid muscle, which is a, a shoulder muscle. So you're gonna see a mouse, and we're gonna inject into the mouse's shoulder. Okay. One side get one side of the mouse gets healthy E. coli, mean, meaning the bad E. coli, <laughs> the, the toxic E. coli and the other side of the shoulder gets the dead stuff. So we, we kill the E. coli. And so what we're gonna do is be able to uh, look and see if we can actually visualize these healthy E. coli. We're gonna wait eight hours, inject the mouse, wait eight hours. Then we're gonna inject C11 PABA, which is this stuff. Wait 45 minutes and then image of the pet. Okay, and let's see what happens. There's the mouse. Okay, and so the, the, we're injecting into the shoulder muscle, either live E. coli or dead E. coli. The dead E. coli is kind of as a control. So like we, we want to ideally not see anything, and guess what? We're not seeing anything when we inject heat killed kind of dead E. coli. Okay, and the live E. coli, the PET scan shows the the bacteria. So this is essentially showing where in the body bacteria reside. And I'm not totally sure what's going on with the, the red images. It's probably in the paper. I should, I should read that. I think, I'm not, I'm not too sure what's going on here. Um, but 
for now, I'm going to focus on, on where the bacteria is injected, and, and that that this, um, that I think this might these might be the kidneys actually. That's that's actually probably right. I think the there's a buildup of this substance in the kidneys waiting to be excreted. Yeah, that's I think that's that's right. Mm, is that the colon? I'm not sure. I don't know mouse physiology too well. But anyway. Yeah, I think the, the, at least this is the kidneys. I think the, uh, the, the mouse is trying to excrete this funny substance. But before it can do that, we can actually do an imaging study and see the, um, the, where the bacteria reside. That's kind of cool. Okay. And this was published in ACS Infectious Disease 2018. And you can get the paper if you like and want to read more about it. It's nice because it's a combination of a little bit of kind of pharmacology that we know about, and also a little bit of organic chemistry, and also medical imaging in a mouse. And you know, the, everything starts in a mouse, and then and then eventually it works its way to human patients. I don't know if this has been applied to study bacteria in humans yet. Okay, I think we're at the stopping point for day one, and I'll continue with the phase one, maybe phase two metabolism stuff next time. Have a good weekend.